Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about multiple random variables. Now, we've talked in previous videos about multiple random variables, but we've always assumed that they are independent. And so today's slide and video are going to talk about what you do when you have random variables that are not independent. We're going to start with discrete random variables, and at the very end, we'll touch very briefly on continuous random variables. All right, so if we have two discrete random variables, let's call them x and y. Uh, we have something called the joint probability mass function, here denoted by that lowercase p of x and y. So it's a function of particular values x and y, and it tells you the probability that the random variable x is equal to the value little x, and that the random variable y is equal to the value little y. Typically, we don't write it using the intersection symbol, but instead we use the comma symbol. So anytime you see that comma symbol, you should be thinking about it as an intersection or the event and another event. All right, so that's the joint probability mass function for two discrete random variables. Here's an example that we'll use throughout the video today. So it's a very simple example. Imagine a box. The box only has five CPUs in it. There's three different speeds, so two of them are 400 megahertz, one of them is 450, one of them is 500, sorry, two of them are 500. So those are the five different CPUs in this box, and all you're going to do is you're going to select two out of the box without replacement, that means you don't put the first one back in before you select the second one, and you're going to do this randomly. And we're going to define that x is the random variable that has the speed of the first one that you randomly pulled out. And then y will be the speed of the second one that you have randomly pulled out. So that's the example we're going to use throughout the day today. If you think about what the possible outcomes of this experiment are, you can just set up a table to describe them. So in this table, what we have is everywhere there's an x, that's something that's possible. And everywhere there's a dash, that's something that's impossible. right? And here, in order to enumerate all the different outcomes, we have assigned numbers to each of the different CPU chips uh, with their speed. So you can see that the first column in the first row has a 400 with then a subscript 1. So that means that we've identified one of those two CPUs that have a speed of 400 megahertz as the number one one and a different one as the number two. And same with the two CPU chips that we have that are a 500 megahertz chip. Okay, and when we do that, um, we can identify all the different possibilities that we can draw. And so for instance, we could draw up in that sort of top left corner, we could draw the first 400 megahertz processor uh, as our x variable, and we could draw the second 400 megahertz processor as our y. Okay, what we can't do is redraw that first 400 megahertz processor twice, because remember we're doing this drawing without replacement. So that means we do not put the processor back in the box, therefore it cannot be drawn again. And that's why we have a dash in that very upper left corner. And if we construct the outcomes of the experiment this way, then it's a reasonable belief that each outcome is equally likely, because all we're doing is randomly selecting each of these different chips. And so all the x's in this table have equal probability, all the dashes have zero probability because they both can't occur. All right, and now from this table, we can define the joint probability mass function. Remember that joint probability mass function here for these random variables x and y that we've defined or just the probability that x will be a certain speed and that y will be a certain speed. And so from this table, we can go ahead and we can figure out what those probabilities will be. So in particular, this is the table that summarizes that previous table, but now has the probabilities for these different events. That is, it has the joint probability mass function for x and y. And so to get this table, all you have to do is look at the previous table and say, all right, how many different ways are there to do this whole experiment? How many different outcomes are possible? And if you add up the number of x's, you get 20. So the denominator is always going to be 20. The next question is, for a particular event, how many different ways are there for that event to occur? So how many different ways are there to draw, say, a 400 megahertz processor followed by another 400 megahertz processor? Well, there's only two ways for that to occur, and those are the top two left x's. Right? Either you can draw the first one first, or you can draw the second one first. Uh, maybe I should say it this way. You can draw the number one first, or you can draw the number two first in terms of those two 400 megahertz processors. And so if you go through that process, you can find that 
hey, the only way, the probability of drawing uh, two 400 megahertz processors is 2 out of 20. If you look at the very middle cell, you can see that that cell has zero. This is the event that both X and Y are 450 megahertz. But if you look at back at the table, right, there's no way for that to occur because there's only one 400 megahertz processor in our uh, box. Okay, so this is the joint probability mass function for X and Y. Now, using this joint probability mass function, we can answer a number of probability questions that we might ask. So, for example, we might want to know, what's the probability that X is equal to Y? Or what's the probability that X is greater than Y? All right, so if we start with that first question, what's the probability that X is equal to the Y? What we need to do is we need to go back to the table and we need to uh, find each of the cells where that's the case, where that event occurs that X is equal to Y. And it turns out that that's exactly the diagonal in this table. So we just take the diagonal and we add up all of those probabilities, and that will tell us the probability that X is equal to Y. So there's a situation, 400, 400, 450, 450, 500, 500. The probabilities were 2 out of 20, 0 out of 20, and 2 out of 20. So you add those up, you get 4 out of 20 or 0.2. Now, if we're thinking about what's the probability that X is greater than Y, right? So these are the situations in the table. If we go back to the table here. These are the situations in the table that are in the upper right triangle. So in the upper right triangle, we have the situations where, say, X is 450 and Y is 400, X is 500, Y is 400, and X is 500 while Y is 450. So we just add up the probabilities in the right upper triangle there, and we'll find the probability that X is greater than Y. That turns out to be about 0.4. And so we can answer a number of these probability questions for these two random variables, X and Y, using that joint probability mass function. All right, so let's move on and talk about expectation. Remember that expectations for discrete random variables are the function summed or a weighted average of the function where the weight is the probability. And that's exactly what we have here now for two random variables. So we have some function h of both random variables x and y. It doesn't have to be of both, it could be of just one. And it, we have then the sum where this sum notation, where we have underneath that summation notation, the x and the y, that just says over all values of x and y. We plug in the h function, and we multiply by the probability of x being equal to little x and y being equal to little y. And we just add those all up, and that's called the expectation for these two random variables, x and y. As an example, suppose that we are interested in the uh, expected absolute speed difference. Right, so we have the absolute value of the difference between x and y, and we're trying to find uh, the expected value of that quantity. So if we go back to the uh, previous page and we look at the definition for expectation, we have this situation where now h must be that absolute difference function. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're going to plug in that h into the definition. So here's a plugged into the definition where we have that absolute value of x minus y. We multiply that by that probability and we sum up over all the possible values. And so here we can do this and maybe we're just going along the rows to start off with. And so we start on row one and we go across the columns. So we have uh, 400 minus 400 times that probability, which was two out of 20 or 0.1. And then we just go to the middle one and the last one. And then we can do that for all of the different rows. And if we do that calculation and just plug in the numbers and do it, we find that we get a value of 60. So the expected absolute speed difference here is 60. All right, so uh, recall that we have previously something we call the probability mass function. And we've introduced today the joint probability mass function. When we want to distinguish between these two, we're gonna talk about a marginal probability mass function. So if you have discrete random variables x and y with the joint probability distribution, joint probability mass function that we previously defined, then the marginal probability mass functions, you have one of them for x and one of them for y, basically just involves summing out the other random variable. So here's the marginal probability mass function for x, and you notice we sum over the values for y in that probability, uh, that joint probability mass function. If we're trying to get the probability marginal probability mass function for y, then we just sum over the values for x. If we apply this to our example, then what we're really talking about in this table is taking a sum over the columns or a sum over the rows, depending on which uh, marginal distribution we're interested in. So in particular, if we're interested in looking at the marginal distribution for x, which goes across the columns, 
then we're going to sum the rows within each column. So if you sum the first, all the rows in the first column, you get 0.4. If you sum the middle one, you get 0.2. If you sum the last one, you get 0.4. And that's then the marginal distribution for x. The marginal distribution for y here is found by just summing across the columns for each row. So if we take that first row and we sum across the columns, we get again 0.4. For the second, the middle row, we get 0.2, and the last row, we get 0.4. Right, so it turns out in this uh, example, because we have built a joint probability mass function that's symmetric, we have a marginal probability mass function for x and y that are actually the same functions. All right, so recall we had this idea of independence, and the definition for independence was that the probability mass function the joint probability mass function for two random variables is equal to the product of the marginal probability mass functions for every value of x and y, if the two random variables are independent. To show that two random variables are not independent, all we have to do is find one set of values for x and y that this equation is not true. Right, so the easiest way to do this in this particular example is to look and see that very middle cell. So notice that there's zero probability that both x and y are 450, right? And that's because we can't draw 450 out of the box twice because there's only one of those chips, okay? But the marginal probability for each random variable to be 450 is non-zero, right? It's 0.2 and 0.2. And so this very quickly shows us that these two are not independent because you can just do the calculation and say, look, uh, the joint probability for them both being 450 is zero but the product of their marginal probabilities of being 450 is non-zero, right? It's 0.2 times 0.2. And therefore, because this equation is not true, these two random variables are not independent. Intuitively, this should make sense because once we've drawn one of the chips of the box and we know what speed it is, that changes what we think about the distribution for the second draw. Okay, so intuitively, hopefully, it makes sense to you that these two should be independent. All right, so we have uh, this idea of covariance of two random variables, x and y. The definition for the covariance is this right here. It's the expectation of the product of the difference for each random variable to its own expectation. So here, the mu x is the expectation of x, and mu y is the expectation of y. Okay, so that's the definition of covariance. If you were to plug in x equals y, or maybe, uh, sorry, y equals x, so that you have two x's in there, you would find that the covariance of x and x is just the variance of x, right? Just go back and remind yourself what the definition of variance is to uh, see that that's true. All right, so here's an example of covariance in this uh, CPU example. So first, you should verify on your own from the, the marginal probability mass functions that the expected values are 450 and that the variances are 2,000 because we're going to need that in this very covariance calculation. So the covariance between x and y, we just plug in the definition, right? It's that expectation. We've already talked about expectations as a weighted average. Okay, so we just have that weights with the weights of the probabilities. And now we do this for all the different combinations of x and y, and this time I didn't do all of them, and so there's a couple of them with the dot, dot, dot representing all the others. And if we just do the calculation, we find that we get negative 500. So the covariance between x and y is negative 500. And now, generally, a covariance is a bit difficult to interpret. And so usually what we do is we sort of standardize it. Not the way that we standardize normal random variables before, but instead we, well, maybe similar to that. Uh, but here, what we're going to do is calculate the correlation. So the correlation is just the covariance divided by the square root of the product of the variances for each individual random variable. Although we could write that denominator slightly differently and say that the denominator is the product of their standard deviations. All right, so the nice thing about this correlation is that it's now interpretable for sort of any problem that you come upon. And the reason it is, is because the correlation is sort of, sort of standardized in that it's always gonna be between minus one and one. And because it's always between minus one and one and because these particular values have meaning, the meanings here are uh, if you're one, or minus one, then there's an exact linear relationship between x and y. In particular, if rho is equal to one, if this correlation is equal to one, 
That implies that there's a relationship between y and x of this form. y is equal to m times x plus b, where m is positive. If rho, this correlation, is negative 1, that implies the same equation, except this time m is negative. That slope is negative. Okay, So that's what happens if you have exactly this correlation being 1 or negative 1. More generally, you can think about rho as being, this correlation as being the measure of the linear association between y and x. So if this correlation is close to 1 or minus 1, then that indicates a strong linear relationship. If it's close to 0, that indicates not much of a linear relationship or a lack of linear relationship. In this example with the CPU chips, we have the correlation, we have the variances, we can calculate then the correlation. So we just plug it into the formula and we find that the correlation is negative 0.25. So this indicates that there's sort of a weak negative linear association association between x and y. All right, so this was all for discrete random variables so far. Let's talk briefly about continuous random variables. I'm not going to go into as much depth. But there's a lot of analogs between uh, continuous and discrete random variables. So continuous random variables have a joint probability density function. We're going to denote it here the same way that we denoted the pro joint probability mass function for discrete random variables. But now we use this a bit differently, right? Remember that the probability that a random variable, a continuous random variable, is equal to any particular value is zero. So we don't have this probably x is equal to little x and probably y is equal to little y. But what we have instead is that we have probabilities that we can calculate using this probability density function, this joint PDF. And we do it by integrating over this function. So as an example, if we're trying to calculate the probability that x is between a and b and that y is between c and d. So one way you could visualize this is to think about drawing an x, y plane, perhaps like this. And you have a box for x between a and b, and you have a box for y between c and d. And if you have that situation, then you can calculate the probability that this is true by integrating this function. So there's the integral you want to do. You want to integrate x from a to b and integrate y from c to d over this joint probability mass function. If you want to try to visualize this, what you should think about is having x and y now uh, on the coordinate plane, but down here. So you've got this box. And you've got this surface, that's the joint probability mass function above it. And then this probability is the area, uh, sorry, actually it's the volume that is uh, created by taking that box that is x between a and b and y between c and d and rising it up to this joint probability mass function, this surface. And that area is a probability and it's the probability of x being between a and b and y being between c and d. That's all the more I'm going to be talking about this. Uh, certainly we could get much more in depth on it and create much more interesting areas, but that suffices for what we need to know. All right, you can, like with discrete random variables, you can calculate marginal probability density functions, and you do it by integrating out the other random variable. So if you want the marginal PDF for x, you integrate out y and vice versa. You have the same idea of independence, that is the joint probability mass function is the product of the marginal probability density function. Did I say mass function? I meant joint PDF is equal to the product of the marginal PDFs. And one appealing aspect of using the notation that I use here is that this statement is true now, whether P are probability mass function or probability density functions. Uh, we have expected values, but now for continuous random variables, instead of taking a sum, we have to take integrals. Um, but otherwise, the ideas are exactly the same. I'm going to finish off this video to talk very briefly about properties of variances and covariances. We've talked about this a bit before, but only in the context where you had independence. And so now we're going to talk about what happens if you don't have independence. So if you have this variance of a times x plus b times y plus c, it turns out that the formula you need is a squared times the variance of x plus b squared times the variance of y plus 2 times a times b times the covariance of x and y. So previously when we talked about this, we didn't have the covariance, and that's because the covariance was 0 when x and y are independent. The covariance gets kind of tricky, but if you want to, here's a way to uh, calculate the covariance for uh, two, possibly two sums on either side of that covariance. 
I'm not going to go through that in detail. Uh, in particular, the covariance is symmetric, as is the correlation. This should be pretty easy to see if you go back to that definition of covariance. And finally, let's talk briefly about what happens if these are independent. So if x and y are independent, then the covariance is zero, and then that first variance equation simplifies. And it, all right, it simplifies to this equation right here, right? You just have a squared times the variance of x plus b squared times the variance of y. Okay, so uh, in summary of what we talked about in this video, right, we introduced the idea of multiple random variables for discrete random variables. We had a joint probability mass function and probability and marginal probability mass functions. For continuous random variables, we had joint probability density function and marginal probability density functions. We had this idea of expected value. We had introduced correlation and covariance. All right, so this is the last video in a larger set of videos that are all in a playlist that hopefully you'll be linked to here. Uh, talking about a brief introduction to probability and what you need to start understanding what's going on uh, with statistical inference and then regression, which are gonna be the next two sets of videos. Hope to see you on those videos.